Hi, my name is Madeline Thorne and Smith and this is my studio. Hi, this is my studio. Um, my studio is in West Heidelberg, which is in the north of Melbourne. Um, I'll do a little show around of the main things I've got <laughs> set up here today. Um, a lot of the works uh, over here are um, frame pieces that I made um, while I was overseas a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic. Um, I mean, obviously when I'm working in the studio, I don't have them all laid out like this, but just to, to give everyone an idea of what my work's about. So these are pieces, uh, most of which I made when I was on residency in Peru a couple of years ago at Cotto Designs. Um, so I was in Lima and I did a 10 week residency and for a while I wasn't actually sure what I wanted to make there but I started getting quite inspired by my walks to the studio um, where I'd see these textured walls um, that were on the buildings. So after a while I decided I would start actually putting clay on the walls and that's how you get these these textured pieces those are textures of of the walls there um, in a in a suburb called Barranco which is kind of similar to if you're familiar with Melbourne it's it's a little bit like um, Collingwood or if say you're familiar with New York it's sort of like your Brooklyn suburbs are sort of yeah edgy in a suburb <laughs> um, and I also got quite interested in the frames, which you call, like a frame is a marco in Spanish. Yeah, if you're f familiar with a lot of um, Latin American folk art, the frame is very important. Um, you might see often like a, like a virgin in the middle or an icon. Um, I guess I was more interested in the frame itself because that's been an area of ongoing research for me. Um, the frame as as a common support, I guess, in Western in the Western tradition it's it's simply a support for the real art, which is the painting in the middle or the drawing in the middle. But for me the actual frame itself um, is art and there is a tradition to frame making in itself, particularly in places like Latin America. So another thing I got interested in when I was um, studying at university was the idea of uh, casting paintings and creating archetypes um, that are found in art and ceramics like the frame and the plinth and the canvas. So I particularly honed in on painting because I originally studied painting. This is a new one that I made recently. There's a little bit of a render in the middle there and then I've got the texture of the paint around the outside. This is a little one I really like. It's actually the outside is paper mache, but the inside is a little bit of cast paint. Just a small, small example. Uh, on these ones, I've also got textures, like the textures of studio materials you'd find when packing ceramics such as bubble wrap and polystyrene cubes. Um, I'm really interested in these textures too because they're also kind of considered discarded materials I suppose in the studio that you would just throw out once you're done with them but I'm elevating these textures and materials too. So here's an example I'm quite proud of. I have this cast painting sitting uh, on its own easel. So if you can see, I'll pick it up and see the texture of the painting. And on the back, you can also see the staples and the folds of the canvas. And it's those little details I'm really interested in. And, and also asking the question, if you have this replica of a painting and often I make pieces like this and then I frame them and I sell them in, art galleries that also sell paintings. How is the value of a cast painting different to a real painting? Why is it usually priced lower because it's ceramic than oil on canvas?
I guess it comes down to the tradition of the hierarchy that exists in Western fine art and ceramics was often treated as a lowly decorative art. But I, I suppose I'm trying to elevate ceramics so it's at that level of the high art in inverted commas. I'll talk a little bit now about my process. So when I'm doing slip casting, generally I have to make a mold first using plaster of what texture I want to cast. So with these ones, I've cast things like expanding foam, polystyrene, I've got uh, bubble wrap over here, and I've got concrete render. Um, over here as well, I've got, these are some of my painting molds. So this is that painting mold I show, showed you before. Here's a big painting mold at the back and some smaller ones. This is one of my favorite ones. It's a two part painting mold. And here I've got classic shells. I got a little bit obsessed with shells. This is this one before from Peru with the little mollusk. I love my shell molds. I often use them as decorations for my frames. So when I'm slip casting, uh, I usually have to start off by just mixing up my slip because it does kind of solidify, but once you get it going again, it, uh, yeah, it's nice and runny again. Some people make their own slip, but because I'm pretty time poor, I work a few jobs as well. I just find it easier to buy a slip that's ready to go. So I'm just going to show you how a slip cast with both a one piece and a small two piece mold, shell molds. Um, this is that same shell that I collected uh, when I was in Peru uh, and this is a one piece mold of a shell. So I've got my slip ready to go. If you've ever done chocolate making it's very similar to that. So I'm just going to slowly pour the slip in to fill the whole mold. Okay, just a little bit beyond the edge like that. I'll do it with the other one as well. It's pretty pretty easy casting small molds like this. When you have bigger, more complex molds, it's not quite so simple. Okay. And now basically we'll wait until we see the mold sucking out the moisture out of the edge of the piece. So you'll be able to actually see half a millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeters, probably wouldn't go beyond two millimeters. And then you chuck the excess out back into your original container. Okay, so we've left our pieces for a few minutes. Basically, I'd probably usually leave them between three and five minutes for a mold this small. I mean, with this smaller mold, you could just make it solid, but I've decided to make it hollow. So you can see, maybe that's a couple of millimeters, three millimeters max. So I'm gonna empty out the excess now. So you can leave that sitting upside down for a while, but this one doesn't have that much clay in it. So you can kind of do it just in one. Let's see how that's our piece that we'll let dry and then we'll take out of the mold. Same with our two part mold. Very carefully empty out the slip over our container. There's no rush. Um, what I would recommend is just putting it upside down and just leaving it for a minute or two. And then with these pieces, you can't take them out until the slip is dry. So see how it's still quite shiny and wet? Probably have to wait another 10 minutes for it to be dry at least. And then it'll be uh, ready to take out. Okay, so now we've waited about 10 minutes. Um, I've tested this one. This one comes out really easily. So you'll notice it's not so shiny in the middle now. So the slip has dried somewhat. Um, so we can just easily 
bring that out and that's your cast piece and if you want to attach it to things make sure you do it before the piece dries because you'll find it dries pretty quickly now we'll try the two-part mold so I'll remove the elastic bands and this is two part because there's a little mollusk on it that would catch if we made it one part so there's you can see one part there yep and then we can use that to gently pull it out probably could leave this one a little longer but it's still a bit soft but you can still get it out here we go and then I'd spend a little bit of time trimming the edges and you can see that seam line there too just getting rid of that and then your piece is ready to go